to speak a bit from Acts chapter 1. And I want to talk about the role of the Spirit in our lives to help us and to equip us in doing God's work. I want to use this passage, the first few verses of Acts chapter 1, to set up some examples I want to share of how God uses unlikely people for doing his work. So that hopefully through scripture we'll take a look at his examples and at our own lives and see where the two might intersect and how we can draw strength from scripture by being able to relate to it. In Acts chapter 1, I want to particularly focus on um, verse 6 and start from there. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and in all and to, the, and to the ends of the earth. He's talking with them and he says, you know, it's not for you to know these things that you're asking me, the times and the dates that the Father has set, but you, this is what's gonna happen. This is what I want you to be concerned with, that you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will become my witnesses. And he tells them in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And then he's taken up from among them. These are folks who wrestled with a lot of uncertainty. These were disciples who had followed Jesus for a long time and had misunderstood Jesus and Jesus' mission and Jesus' purpose for much of the time with Jesus. So those of you who feel that I'm still trying to figure this Jesus thing out, not necessarily whether or not he's real, but what he wants from our lives and, and what he's trying to develop in our lives, know that you're in good company because these are folks who walked with Jesus and lived with him and still had difficulty trying to pinpoint what it was that he wanted them to do. So think about this. They witnessed Jesus' life, his miracles, his arrest, his trial, his beatings, his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, and now they've had fellowship with him. Here Luke tells us that they had fellowship, that Jesus revealed himself to them for about 40 days before he was caught up into heaven. But when they have this chance to talk with Jesus before the ascension, their question is, are you going to take care of the Romans? We've been under this occupation. We have not been able to really function like the kingdom of, of Israel, like of days of old under, under David. Are you going to finally kick Roman butt? Because now we know you've got the goods. Now we see that you've got the guts. We watched you walk on water. We watched the things that you've done. But coming back from the dead, that's some good stuff, Jesus. To throw everybody off. I mean, you, you kind of scared us there. When you, like, when you died and everything, like, yeah, you kind of had us going. But you walking around here letting us put our fingers down into the holes of your hand and say, hey, touch my side and all this kind of stuff. We're thinking, man, we thought Jesus went soft. We thought he was weak. He just went into the ground for three days just to show he really was the stuff. So now, now that you can walk through walls and whatnot, now that you can go into the bowels of the earth for three days and come back and you're strong, we get it. Are you going to take care a Roman oppression now? Are you going to restore Israel? Are you going to hook us up? And his response is so interesting. He says, you know what the Father has said in his times is not really your business. This is not your concern. This is what I want you to be concerned with. I want you to stay here in the city until you are empowered by my spirit. Because John talked about baptizing you with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you power and I'm going to give you authority because it's something I want you to do. Now, fast forwarding this, understanding church history. The very witness, the very testimony, the very lives of these men and women who followed Jesus were part of what helped to overthrow the Roman government, what helped to make it endorse Christianity, which, which through their bloodshed as they came rolling down the streets in the Roman Empire, it caused them to scratch their heads and their chins and rethink Christianity because of how convicted these individuals were that Jesus was the Christ, that he was raised from the dead, that he was the Son of God, and their convictions troubled the powers that were in place. So they're asking him, are you going to do something about Roman occupation? Not understanding that they and their testimonies would be what God would use to begin to change the world. And so I've entitled today's message, Today's College Students, Tomorrow's World Changers. Because even as you sit uncertain about what your major is, your calling is not uncertain. 
And even though you're not sure what degree or what major will be, will be um, engraved on your diploma, you know this. God's spirit rests in your heart. And there's a plan that God has for you. And so they misunderstood that what they were asking Jesus to do, they would actually be a part of performing if they were to understand the role of Jesus now in their hearts. That this Jesus, who they thought was a sure threat to the status quo, that same Jesus had made them a threat to the status quo. I want you to understand this, students, that you may feel uncertain and insecure in so many areas of life, but God's call to you and God's spirit in your heart is no mistake and it's no light thing. That God is going to bring change to the world, not because of the major you select or the family you come from or how good you live. God's transformation of your society, the spheres of influence that you have and you will have, will take place because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your lives and in your heart. And so while you're determining what your majors may be, or what focus you want to go in, or what graduate school or program you want to focus on, while you're wrestling with uncertainty, stand surely and firmly on this. I've been filled with God's spirit, and he will use me as a part of his plan to touch this planet. A couple other points I want to bring up in this story before I give some practical experiences. Point two is that they totally missed what Jesus' incarnation was about. Jesus did not come into the earth, did not come to the world just so that they could observe him. He actually came so that they would emulate his life, his fellowship with the Father, his undying loyalty and obedience, his loving kindness towards outsiders and marginalized people, and in being filled with the Spirit. That Jesus, rather than having them look to Jesus and saying, are you going to take care of the enemy right now? He was trying to fill them with the Spirit so that they could face the enemies of their days. This is what he really wanted that he would use them and their witness to change the world. They were called to be witnesses, which caused them to be world changers. Because being a witness is not just one that can just say Jesus is good. A witness not only has a revelation of God, but the power to live out that revelation and to share that revelation. And in that revelation, God used this motley crew, this, this unlikely crew of would-be leaders to change the world. For 2,000 years, the church has been building hospitals and schools and universities to train, to touch, to heal the nations. He used a group of unlearned people to influence influencers so that the world could come to feel God's healing and God's love and God's compassion. The next point is that he gave them power to love those on the fringe. That's why he said, start in Jerusalem, then go to Judea and Samaria, to the utmost parts of the world. That the way that they were gonna become world changers was to love. Not just because of their degrees, or their majors, or their training, or their ordinations, but their ability to love those that no one else had loved, to see those that no one else sees, to befriend those who are ostracized and disenfranchised. Their ability to love across cultural and other status lines is what allowed the love of Jesus to become real. A couple of other examples before I, I, I point us to another scripture. Jesus saw, recruited, called, trained, challenged, rebuked, and equipped these leaders. They didn't seek Jesus. He will provide and guide you for the purpose that he's called you to. He will guide you. And it's not because you land on the right thing. It's because he will guide you. And he will take you there. The reason why I wanted to look at this passage before flipping over to Mark chapter five, where we see Jesus healing a man who'd been possessed by a legion of devils. Again, that's, that's Mark five, I'm just gonna reference that. I won't necessarily read a passage from it because of this is because of um, the time. But it's an example of Jesus touching someone who questioned their readiness. You know, I believe that there's something special that God's doing on campuses. Because I think you're in a very interesting place. Some of it, and I said interesting, because some of where you are in life is good, and some of it is sort of questionable. But being college students, you're too old to really be kids and treated like children. But in some ways, you don't want the full responsibilities of being an adult. You still want your parents to foot the bill on certain kinds of things. You still want to borrow the car. There are things you still want. You still want to be included in family vacation on someone else's dime. 
But you're in a place where you really feel a sense of concern about the injustice in the world. That maybe you are too immature or just too, absorb, too self-absorbed in just being adolescent. That's not bad. That's not because you're here in California. Just when you're young, life is about me. How, how do I look? How do I fit in? Am I popular? Am I too tall? Am I too short? Am I too fat? Do I fit in? Can I dance? Am I a good kisser? Do people like me? Am I attractive? Is my acne going away? You know, you know all of this stuff. We're worrying that we're so self-absorbed. But then pretty soon when people get into their careers and their lives and their families and their homes, they become so busy and preoccupied with something else. You're in this unique phase of life where you're learning about the world and the history and the future and you actually have the audacity to think that you might be able to impact change. You actually believe that you can, that you can do that. And you know what? I think you're right. And I think because of your openness and your teach, your, the fact that you're teachable puts you in a position where God can begin to lay things in your heart and train you and develop you in ways that are very key, that you may not get time like this again in your life to really build the friendships and the networks and the connections and the faith and the testimony and the witness that you're doing right now. So one of the reasons why I've loved working with InterVarsity, I've never worked for them as an, as an employee, I was on their board for a number of years, is because I love the fact that they pinpoint campuses because they believe that tomorrow's leaders are on campuses. What I think my job is, is to let people who are on campuses understand that even when you think you don't have the goods and you don't have the credentials and you don't have what it takes, God's plan is still, being ta is still taking place in your heart and in your lives. There are things that God spoke to me. As I sat in an auditorium just like this at the University of Wisconsin almost 30 years ago that are happening in my life today. There are connections I made sitting in an auditorium like this, meeting people who helped me plant the church that I now lead, who helped me create the Urban Center for Leadership, for, for leadership Development that I, now, that I now lead, that I met people as a student who would help me to create ministry and opportunities and jobs in our post-Christian community because Madison feels like it's so beyond Christianity that has caused even the atheists and the agnostics to rethink God because of the love of the church for the marginalized people in that community. And so I'm not just speaking as an older guy that, that, that wants to come and say, listen, you're Western, you're smart, you're fluent, you're educated, you owe God, get out of here and save the world. I'm saying to you, it's not that you've got this responsibility or culpability because you have the ability to be educated, I'm saying that I believe that because God loves you and has a plan for your life, he's brought you into an environment like this. Not just for what you learn, but for who you meet and the things that you learn through being mentored and encouraged and taught, both in the classroom and out of the classroom, is actually shaping you for what God wants you to do down the road. And I want you to take this time seriously because you might be waiting for a better time where you're going to know more and see more. I want you to understand that God can use you right where you are. Which brings me to the story in Mark chapter 5, where there's this man that's demon-possessed. Jesus lands in this Gentile region where they're herding pigs, and this man is living in the tomb. I'm sure you know the story. He runs up to Jesus. They have this, this, this interaction. And he asks Jesus, you know, what are you doing here? You're tormenting me. And Jesus frees this man from the demons. The demons leave. They run into the pigs. The pigs are choked in the sea. And he sets this man free. The people in the town are freaked out because Jesus has done this. He's ruined their economy. This Jewish man has come and killed all this pork. It's an affront to them, and they tell Jesus to leave. The man wants to follow Jesus because he's never had community before. He's never been respected before. He's always been the community um, freak, and Jesus has treated him like a human being. He wants to follow Jesus, but Jesus tells him, no, go home. Just be a great witness of what the Father has done for you. Just do what you can do. He didn't ask him to do anything that he was incapable of doing. And he didn't ask him to do anything that he had not been empowered to do. With what you have, with what you know, be a witness today. Very seldomly in scripture do you see Jesus telling someone, no, you go home. That when they wanted to follow, he would let them follow. Unless they said, let me bury my dead first, let me go sell some cattle first. Then he said, let your dead bury your dead. He, he challenged those folks, but very seldom did you see someone saying, I'm ready to go, and they're sincere. And he says, no. Well, in Mark 5, 
this man starts ministering. He starts sharing what Jesus told him to do. In Mark chapter 7, verse 31, Jesus comes back to the Decapolis, to this Gentile region. And people, the same folks that told Jesus to leave, are bringing out their sick for Jesus to heal them. Because through this man's ministry, the community is open to hear the life and the love of Jesus and receive the healing that I think he wanted to offer in Mark 5, but they weren't ready. But he used someone who wasn't prepared, still had scars on his arms from cutting himself, hadn't been trained in how to teach the Alpha course, had not been led in how to be a small group leader, was never an RA, never led any leadership meetings, never led Bible study, never was a part of an accountability group. It was just him, the bones, and the ghosts. But with just sharing the fact that I was in darkness and Jesus loved me, Open the hearts of the people in that Gentile region for Jesus to come back and begin to minister. I believe that as students who are future teachers and dentists and doctors and construction administrators and architects and engineers, nurses and pharmacists, you're able to touch people and go in places where I as a pastor will never go. Jesus could have brought that man along with him but he knew that that man was better helped to the kingdom by staying there and going in places where the doors were closed to Jesus than to follow Jesus and just ride on this boat. There are places where you can go and things that you can do because of the time you have, the flexibility, your sense of invincibility. There are things that you will do just because you don't even think about death or old age or retirement. You can think it, you can envision it, you're willing to try things that are new. That's why whenever people have wanted to subvert societies, they've gone after people in your stage of life with your mentality, with your intellect, because they know that if they can get a hold of the minds of your generation because you're influential, you'll share what you know. But the same thing is true for good. Do you understand that in changing the landscape of our nation, God has used college students? I don't know if you noticed this or not, but I'm African-American. The lighting's bad up here, so I didn't know if you knew or not. <laughs> I have benefited from the civil rights movement. And any other people of color in here, you have too. Any others are part of migrant families who've come here in the last, who moved here in the last few years, and whose grandparents had to change their names so that they wouldn't be hated. You have also benefited from civil rights. But do you understand that this great movement that has changed the landscape of our country really was pushed ahead by college students? Do you understand that? that way before Dr. King was really known for the I have, a, I, have a, I have a dream speech, do you know that there were students in North Carolina who went to a Woolworth, which was like a diner, and African Americans could order food at the back and carry it home, but they couldn't sit down on those little red stools. Four African American men from NC, North Carolina A&T, said, you know what, we're tired of buying our food and going home. We're going to eat here. The woman at the counter said, no, you're not. And they had the first sit-in, four African-American male students. The next day, they showed up with 24 students, four of whom were African-American women from Bennett College. The following day, white women showed up who had come from NC's women's college. They showed up. They shut Woolworth down, and within four to six months, 54 cities in nine states had sit-ins. It was students, not the business leaders, because we we're busy thinking about our clientele. It was not the pastors. It was not the campus leaders. It was not the politicians. It was 18 and 19-year-old students. And it was interracial, because if it had been just the black students, they might have turned on the water hoses and sick the dogs on them and beat them right in broad daylight, because that's what was happening in that day. But because our white brothers and sisters showed up and sat on the stools next to us and said, hell no, this ain't happening. without texting or Facebooking or lighting or liking or tweeting, 
The message went throughout the country, nine states. Can you imagine what we could do now? Do you understand that right now you probably have as many people following you on Facebook than most pastors in the world have ever communicated with? That by just saying you dyed your hair or frosted your tips, <laughs> you communicate more cross-culturally and internationally than most of my colleagues have in the entire ministry. Do you understand what's at your fingertips through technology and knowledge and integrity and, and, and conviction? So when we talk about the civil rights movement, and my undergraduate degree was in African American history, so this is dear to my heart. We rarely talk about the young adults who are on campuses. Don't you know that their parents told them, you better not do that? Don't you know that there were some black parents who were proud, but others said, listen, don't let them kill you. Get the education. We sent you to school. Don't let them do this. Please go to class. I can't, mama. This is my conviction. Don't you know? That there were white children there whose parents said, don't you know you're white? Get back to class. <laughs> you have some other kind of way. We'll donate, we'll donate to the National Negro College Fund. They said, I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, Dad. And they sat with their brothers and sisters. It changed this nation. College students. I don't have enough time to give the details of what happened in Tiananmen Square in China. And for any of you who are old enough or Google it, you'll see a lone student standing in front of one of the tanks. You see, what happened on the, Ed on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama in the 60s was typical of what took place. People were putting fire hoses on people, throwing bags of urine on marchers, throwing dog feces at them, releasing their dogs on them. What happened in Selma, Alabama on that bloody day is that the news cameras were there. And when America saw that happening to peaceful people, America said, this will not happen here. America just assumed that protesters were upset and violent and they got their just desserts. But when they sat there on CBS and NBC saw, seeing peaceful, law-abiding men and women being beaten with clubs and kicked by police officers, America rose up and five states that week were moved to begin the process of changing their voting registration laws because they saw it. There was a lot of stuff happening in Tiananmen Square. College students started writing notes about what was happening and faxed it to the world. A student. So we see this image of this young man standing in front of this, this tank and we talk about what's happening. What the world doesn't talk about was a college student faxed the truth to churches all over the world and said, I don't know if you know, this is what's happening. The cameras landed, the people showed up, and all of a sudden it was accountability just like the 1960s Edmund Pettus Bridge in Alabama. Several years ago there was something in the Ukraine called the Orange Revolution where people felt that an election had been stolen. But the comfortable law-abiding, tax-paying, Business leaders didn't take to the streets to revolt because they had too much to lose. But students came outside, said, this is wrong. This is wrong. And the people being afraid to join them just gave them coats and gave them food. Eventually, one million people took to the streets and the stolen election was overturned and people were given back the leadership of their community. College students in the Ukraine kick that off. Some of the greatest revolutions of our time have taken place because men and women who are undecided in their major but very decisive in their faith stood for Jesus. You as a student come from a long line of spiritual heritage of men and women who did not show up on campuses because they wanted to get rich and get paid. You come from a legacy of men and women who showed up on campuses because they wanted to be equipped for helping the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the outsiders of our society. Campuses have been co-opted by greed and we're training nothing but money makers and financial whores. Christian colleges 
if we're not careful, will become the same breeding place. We're just spiritual whores. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. Our lives are not just about getting our own. Our Savior told us, I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do what my Father did. I came to do what I saw him do. How do we think we can be followers of Jesus and not ascribe to that same tenet of faith? I'm not saying that you can't do well and can't be well off and can't be wealthy. I run a nonprofit. I thank God for wealthy people who have great hearts, who fund ministry all over this world. This is not a bash against it. But I'm just saying, whatever it is you do, it's got to be the, for the good of the kingdom, to serve, to give, to donate. I'm just saying, you have this precious time. This is not just about finding the right one or merely your major. It's about lining up with God, and God will bring you and give you who and what it is you need. This world needs more changing and it needs more orange revolutionaries. It needs more Woolworth sit-ins and it needs more men and women who will stand up in the Tiananmen squares or places of adjustment, of, of, of injustice and say, no, not on our watch, not in our time, because I'm using this opportunity to commit and recommit myself to God. And whatever I choose and whatever path I take will be his ability to equip me for what he's called me to. You live in this world. Jesus, are you gonna make it sweeter? Are you gonna let me have a good life? Are you gonna bring down injustice? He's like, you know what, let's not talk about that right now. Let's just talk about this. Let's get you full of the spirit then you will see to the justice that you're asking me about. Do the church being wet nurses to, to babies that were thrown away in orphanages or uncovering bodies that died because of the bubonic plague and giving them a proper burial. The church has historically loved those that nobody else wanted. And that has been our legacy. Not our steeples, not our stained glass, not our rhetoricians. It has been our ability to clean up where everyone else has given up. And that's where Christ has been strong. I want to welcome you to your spiritual legacy of students who are using this given time to hear God's call and to realign yourselves with his purpose. He loves you. And even if you think you're undecided, he is very decided concerning you. That's why he's given you his spirit. Jesus, I pray for my brothers and my sisters, my spiritual sons and daughters in this place. They will understand the beauty of this time, of this place, of this campus, this ground that has been hollowed and prayed over, that men and women who come here will hear the voice of God, sense the call of God, receive the spirit of God to become world changers. This university was not established just to promote intellectualism. It was established to promote world change. Release this body, this group, this chapel, on this unsuspecting world, that we would be filled with your power, that we would go and open doors in places like the Decapolis where you're not welcome, but we will open the door so that you can come in and move. Regardless of where our degrees or disciplines take us, we want to be door openers that you may walk in. Come, Lord, fill us with your grace, fill us with your spirit, because we have entered this place, not only this chapel, but this campus, to be encouraged and educated and to worship. But we exit to be world changers. According to Acts 1, 6 through 8, we will be used to bring the change that you want to be in the world. We will finish what you started. We, this campus, Biola, is a response. The Father's response, Jesus, when you pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Biola University is part of your kingdom coming. Thank you for this. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.